It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. How do we approach a loved one with Alzheimer's and other cognitive disorders in a way that affirms their continuing self-identity? Today's guest, Dr. Stephen Post, helps caregivers navigate the challenges of a loved one's cognitive decline. According to Dr. Post, focusing discussion and resources on the dignity of these individuals and the respite needs of their caregivers is vital. Dr. Post is an elected member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of Alzheimer's Disease International and one of only three recipients of the Alzheimer's Association Distinguished Service Award. His newest book is Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. Welcome, Dr. Post. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, John. It's a delight to be with you. So, Dr. Post, you contend that we are conscious in spite of what our brain may be doing. What do you believe the Alzheimer's journey is like for someone with the diagnosis? I use the term deeply forgetful people in the title of this book, and it's very purposeful because I don't much appreciate the term dementia. It's a strictly negative term, a decline from a former cognitive state. And it divides us from them. It's uh, sort of there, but for the grace of God, go I. But in fact, uh, there's a continuum, and everybody has moments of significant forgetfulness in life. I know I do sometimes. uh, I forget where where I parked my car or even that I have a car that's parked, believe it or not. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) so I I, I like the deep forgetfulness piece because it's a little less uh, derisive. And it's also a little more, uh, you know, to be frank, mysterious. Uh, and in answer to your question, um, you know, I've never been willing to respond to any person who says, is grandma still there with a no, because we just can't say. They may have some cognitive uh, deterioration. They may have some effect on their neurology. But underneath that all, uh, in the silence and sometimes in the chaos, you will find that there are these surprising moments of what professionals in the field call paradoxical lucidity, where someone kind of comes back into their own, and uh, they seem to be with it, know who they are. It may not last very long. It may be stimulated by personalized music or by the Alzheimer's poets in Brooklyn or whomever, but they sort of come back into who they are, and they can they can be uh, somewhat, uh, I like to use the word, rementia. They can be remented a bit. And we need to notice that. We need to observe and we need to be open to those possibilities. Doctor, even if someone doesn't come back to who they are, what what you just described, is there any science that has shown they still experience emotions and have feelings? Maybe not as the person they were, but just as a human? Well, uh, yes, as the person they were and as a human. Look, you know, uh, we put too much emphasis on linear rationality in our Western world. But these individuals still have tremendous uh, emotional capacities. Uh, they have emotional intelligence. Uh, they, uh, they have creativity. Uh, they can appreciate music and art. Uh, there are a lot of things that they can do. They can still smell and enjoy the fall leaves. Um, so there's a lot left there. Just because memory has faded, doesn't mean that we should respect these individuals less or think less creatively about how we can interact with them. In fact, there's lots of things that we can do, and uh, and we need to realize that. I think that's such a wonderful point because when a loved one or friend or, or someone who's going through this loses the identity that we know, we tend to push that person aside and forget that they're still a human being. Yeah, and we and, and we forget that there were they're they're always there. I mean, I, I take that position firmly. 
Um, one of my great neurology teachers at the University of Chicago, Sir John Eccles, always said that the human mind, the human consciousness, is more profound than the brain. And you can have a uh, dysfunction in, in a certain part of the brain that lays down short-term memories, uh, the hippocampus, as they say, um, but the person is still there and uh, will occasionally simply beam up in a surprising fashion. So I have all kinds of stories in this book about just those sorts of experiences. And, and uh, um, uh, so we can never say that they're gone, they're a husk, they're a shell, they're, they're dead and so forth. They've changed and we have to work a little harder to communicate with them. In fact, a lot of the book talks about how to do that and don't use open-ended questions. What would you like for breakfast? But you ask, well, would you like ham and eggs or would you like post toasties? So you're always cueing them with your language, and they can oftentimes chime in, whereas if you don't do that, they get defensive and they get more distant. So there's a lot of techniques to communication, and the symbolic side of people's lives never uh, is gone. I mean, Willem de Kooning, the great New York abstract expressionist and artist, he was diagnosed at Cornell with probable Alzheimer's, and he had it for 14 years. For 13 and a half years, he painted in his studio in Greenwich Village. He had a, a liaison with him, and he would just sporadically rise up and dip his brush in that acrylic and go up to the uh, easel, and he would paint. And there was a posthumous exhibit of his work, and some of the reviewers said, oh, it was terrible. He was just a shell of himself. But the one I liked said, wait a minute, this is a guy who had Alzheimer's disease, and for 13 and a half out of 14 years, he knew exactly who he was. He knew he was an artist. He kept drawing, and he knew that somehow who he was was connected with the symbol of that brush and that paint. So he wasn't gone. He was compromised a bit, but he was not gone. I remember watching a movie one day, and the main character's mother was battling Alzheimer's. She, she was suffering from Alzheimer's. And the character had told another person within the story that for years, he tried to pull his mother back into his world of rational thought, always correcting her mistakes and trying to make her fit in, in the world that he was living in. But he finally decided to join her world, and he started to play along with whatever she said. And he said life got so much easier. Do you think that's a good approach? It is, except in the very, very early phases of a progressive dementia, when Somebody can still, in fact, be reminded uh, uh, of the realities around them, and it can be a positive experience for them, and it's consistent with their dignity. However, as they become more deeply forgetful, all you want to do is let them define subjectively the world that they live in, and you can enter into that world. Oliver Sacks, great neurologist from Columbia, wrote a wonderful play called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Well, if she mis if if, if he if he mis well the man who mistook his wife for a hat, just just live with it. Uh, be a hat and don't worry much. Don't get anxious about it. Yeah, so correcting is inappropriate uh, for the most part, uh, but especially after you get to a certain stage where I like to say where people begin to forget that they forget. And then they have a relatively benign um, adjustment uh, to, uh, to this condition, and reminding them can actually be very troubling and very distressful. Doctor, for someone who may not know a whole lot about Alzheimer's, can you take us through the progression in generalities? I know each person is different, but yeah. how long a process is it? How quickly does it move along? Well, as doctors like to say, you've seen one case, you've seen one case. First of all, quick uh, definition. Dementia, as medicine uses it, is a decline from a former mental state, but it can be caused by a lot of different diseases. So, Joan, for example, 100 years ago, what was the main cause of dementia? Well, it was neurosyphilis. People didn't live so old. We didn't have antibiotics, and there was a lot of syphilis around. And um, so dementia can be secondary to Parkinson's disease. Uh, people talk about concussions or um, uh, various traumatic events uh, to the head, uh, which can cause uh, dementia as well. Uh, there are many forms. Alzheimer's probably 
causes about 50% of cases of dementia. And, and what's unique about Alzheimer's is that it's progressive. Um, a lot of the other dementias, like, for example, stroke-related dementia, they're stable over time, more or less. But the Alzheimer's does tend to get progressively worse. Now, you're asking, okay, so uh, how quickly does it get worse? It depends on the case. And I think there's a wonderful woman in Colombia named um, Gayatri Devi uh, who tells us that, in fact, the progression is not just biologically determined, like, you know, it's so by genetics or something. Actually, how we interact with people, uh, how we connect with them, whether we let them feel comfortable and respected, that kind of interaction will actually affect the course of the of the of the disease itself, because of what we call neuroplasticity, that emotion and and environment affect the brain itself, and even epigenetics, that genetic expression is affected by various um, interactions, and that means that um, the more we can treat a person with kindness and gentleness and respect them and go out of our way to notice those hints of continuing self-identity, the less apoplectic we get, the more we can adjust to the fact that, okay, I don't remember my name. My grandmother didn't remember my name when she had probable Alzheimer's years ago. But it doesn't matter that much, even though you might think it matters. It really doesn't. So let them be who they are. Be peaceful. Create a tranquil environment. Use music and art and poetry. I say to every caregiver, you should sing to your loved one because they remember those songs that they identify with deeply over the course of their lives. And it's incredible. A lot of the times they'll chime in and you'll be completely shocked by it. But mm -hmm. it's the truth. And, and so this is what we need to do is we need to we need to create the right environment and then we can slow this thing down. Well, you were bit. just talking anyway. about neuroplasticity and epigenetics. So is there any science that's showing the potential there to reverse it or even prevent it? <laughs> oh, those are tough questions. There is a word that gets used in the neuro literature these days, rementia, as opposed to dementia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when people come back into themselves. There's an Alzheimer's choir in New York called, okay, are you ready for this? The Unforgettables. And yeah. that started at NYU. And, you know, these are caregivers and their loved ones, and they, you know, they may not have communicated much for quite a while, and the person who's affected may just have that chin down on, 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 and, and, and not be talking. But when they start working uh, in a choir uh, on a song that they both identify uh, with deeply from years ago, then they come together, they connect. Uh, oftentimes there's more communication that goes on. And so there is, in a sense, rementia. I saw it at the Brooklyn Memory Disorder Center where there were about 40 people who were quite severely forgetful um, in a big room in chairs uh, around a circle, and you had a two or three Alzheimer's poets in the middle of the room in, in a very musical and engaging way uh, reciting Robert Frost's The Road Less Traveled. And believe it or not, these 40 people there who were not conversant, I would say that at least 30 of them were, come, were chiming in for a line or even a whole verse or even the whole poem. And so then after that, they might be conversant for a few minutes uh, with their caregivers, and it was quite a miraculous thing to see. Then they'll fade back, but it's so meaningful, Joan, for the caregivers because they realize, you know, we're not we're not wasting our time. We're caring for our loved one, and they're still there. We may not be able to see it all the time or feel it, but they're there. And the music and the poetry can bring it out. So you were just talking about caregivers. What are some of the greatest challenges that they face when trying to help a loved one through this journey? Well, there are a lot of different challenges. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is true that we have so many medical ethical dilemmas around dementia. Um, at what point uh, is it appropriate to, to place a loved one in a nursing home? Uh, that's something that caregivers really do struggle with because oftentimes their loved one extracted a promise from them, don't ever put me in a nursing home. 
but there comes a time when, you know, because it's so difficult uh, to manage in complicated cases, there comes a time when professional help is really needed, and a nursing home place it makes a big, a big uh, lot of sense. Now, what I say to caregivers is that doesn't mean you're abandoning your loved one. It just means that you're putting them in a good situation, and you're going to visit at least two or three times a week and maybe assist with oral feeding. You'll be there to talk with them. You, you know, reading, reading poetry to your loved one is very helpful. Just as I said, singing is helpful. Um, you can come in with various meaningful uh, symbols and artifacts uh, that can connect uh, uh, quite well to, to, uh, to, to the love that they've known over their lives. So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, placing in a nursing home is, is a big deal. And then there are all these other things. You know, for example, as this con- you know, continues to progress, we should eventually will, but it's just hard to predict how, how quickly. Uh, do you still want to treat people for uh, other conditions, like, for example, um, diabetes? You know, do you still want to be taking someone who's deep and forgetful and sticking them with a needle for insulin uh, when, in fact, um, they have no insight anymore into what that's for. So they may interpret it subjectively as something like an assault. What about someone who's got a heart problem uh, and is being supported by all kinds of uh, those amazing new heart technologies? Um, what about that? Uh, does someone really, uh, other than for palliative reasons, uh, want to have surgery for uh, tumor removal. Uh, what about an individual uh, who breaks a hip and uh, really can be reasonably well off still in a nursing home or still at home, just tended to, not ambulating, uh, but that's relatively mild and comfortable uh, with, with the right sorts of medications. You bring them into the hospital, and um, lo and behold, uh, it's a new environment. They lose all their sense of connection, and they decline even further cognitively, and so they'll never really be the same. These are all big dilemmas, and so the ethics of, of, of this, of, of, of treatment interventions, um, you know, during COVID, there was a patient I had met who had uh, dementia secondary to Parkinson's disease, uh, and she was up in an intensive care unit. She was on a breathing mask, which was not invasive, which allowed her to get along pretty well. Uh, she could communicate with her loved ones who weren't allowed up there because of the contagion, but she could communicate with them uh, somewhat on um, on phone and on, uh, on iPad. Um, and then the question came up, well, uh, do you really want to put her on a ventilator? And the, the adult children said, yes, yes, because that's what's best treatment. And I suggested, I, I, you know, look, it's your decision, but I think maybe the more compassionate thing to do is leave your mom uh, on a non-invasive feeding mask and let her interact with you more. Because as soon as you put her on that vent, you know, um, she's going to be uh, intubated. Uh, she'll uh, probably be sedated. She will be sedated. And the likelihood of someone 85 years old ever coming back from that is about one in 100. So... So the overuse of technology is a big issue, and medical students who are training and go into the intensive care units, sometimes they'll see three or four or half a dozen individuals who are very, very deeply forgetful and really end their dementia. They belong in the hospice is where they belong. They don't belong in the hospital. Do you think this is something that we should consider for ourselves and, and add into our directives, that you know, the legal documents that we create? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's it's it, with with this particular condition, it's you know the best document, uh, Joan, is not so much a living will, but it's called a durable power of attorney for health care, and it allows you, as an affected individual, to designate a loved one, you know, your caregiver, your primary caregiver, typically, as the decision maker, so they have uh, all the rights to make decisions now. You can put in a few comments. Do not want artificial nutrition and hydration, for example. I think that's probably a pretty good idea because there's no advantage to feeding pigs and artificial nutrition and hydration. In fact, if you look at the studies, people do better, people with 
uh, dementia, um, do better with assisted oral feeding. I did that with my grandmother a bit when I was much younger, you know, apple for apple bran and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, you know, she couldn't swallow too well, so she needed help. And there was a lot that went on between us in those moments of assistance. You know, she would brighten up. I could look into her eyes. I could see that she was still there. And then again, surprisingly, from time to time, she might call me Stevie. And then I really knew she was still there. And that was very, very impressive to me. So um, I don't, you know, artificial nutrition and hydration feeding pigs, they're not good for people with end-stage Alzheimer's. Uh, they actually don't even uh, extend their lives. They live longer with assisted oral feeding. Uh, with the pegs, they get uh, aspiration pneumonia, uh, and they're also pulling out the pegs from their tummies because uh, they see that few inches of rubber sticking out from their belly button. And then they get tied down. And they're uh, sitting there in their, uh, in their uh, urine and so forth, and they get skin infections, which can be lethal. So in general... It's a lot better off to have assisted oral feeding and not to go with a lot of end of, uh, late life technology. So hospice, just do hospice. Use good palliative care. These people do have pain, just like anybody can have pain. It's not due to the dementia, but it's because they have osteoporosis or they have some other uh, arthritic condition or whatever it might be. So they need to be cared for uh, palliatively with pain medications, but they don't need anything else. Are cases of Alzheimer's on the rise? How prevalent is this problem? Uh huh. Good question. Actually, if you look back, uh, everybody thinks there's more and more and more of this going on. Actually, not so. We're becoming more aware of it. Um, however, over the last 15 to 20 years, there's actually been a relative decline per capita in the number of older adults with probable Alzheimer's disease. And people attribute that to a whole lot of things. Number one, you know, we're being a little more careful about healthy aging. Um, you know, people are eating more carefully. They're aware of uh, what they can do to prevent uh, major heart disease and so forth, et cetera. So people are trying to be more healthy. They're getting more ambulation. They're walking more. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. And this healthy aging, and you talked about prevention before, uh, is preventive. In fact, um, if I was going to just, you know, I'm being somewhat tongue-in-cheek here. If I was going to recommend anything to anybody, it would be uh, walk a half an hour a day because we, do, we have studies showing that walking is very helpful for circulation in the brain. And uh, a lot of these uh, cases involve poor circulation or small, very small stroke events in the white matter of the brain. And so walking is good. Uh, it's good for your whole vascular system, but it's especially good for your brain, and that can be helpful. Uh, the other thing is watch your diet. Um, there are people at Columbia, I won't, go, I won't name names, but good people who have studied all the different um, ethnic populations across Manhattan, and what they have found out is that something like a Mediterranean diet seems to be preventive too. That just doesn't mean necessarily a Greek diet, but it means leafy vegetables, uh, vegetables that grow above the, uh, the surface of the ground, not below. Uh, berries are great, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries. Tomatoes are very good. Uh, uh, keep, keep, a, keep control over carbohydrates and sugars because when you do that, uh, you don't have to have a keto diet, but your, but your metabolism changes, and that blood sugar uh, that your brain uses uh, moves away from the normal uh, sort of uh, uh, carbohydrate, sugary stuff to something that's, uh, that's much better for your brain health. I won't go into details. Uh, and I suggest also, uh, you know, uh, pro-social activity, interacting with people, um, using your mind in various ways being creative, um, it's all good. So don't believe um, that this is inevitable and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, there is no drug, none of the existing drugs, which are not terribly useful anyway, uh, none of the existing drugs seem to prevent or delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. 
So it all comes down to how we live our lives, and that can really make a difference. The book is Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. If you'd like to get more information about Dr. Post and his work, you can visit stephengpost.com. That's Stephen with a P-H, stephengpost.com. Dr. Post, thank you so much for joining us. It's a really great reminder to pay attention to our brain health as much as every other part of our body. So thank you for being here. It's a pleasure and to respect people regardless of their state of memory. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.